uh, just hold off starting straight away. Oh, that's good. Thank you for the feedback, letting me know that it's clear. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about essentially how to get the best out of our data color uh, spiders that we use for screen calibrations. If you guys want to ask questions as I'm going along, the chances are I might, might actually answer it a bit later on. But feel free to type in the messages. I'll see them pop up on my um, other screen here so I can try and answer them as I go along or if I do happen to miss something that I may not cover or you would like me to cover then um, I can definitely cover that off there for you. Oh, sorry, that was me. So, part of my role, just to explain this, some of the people haven't met me before, I work for a company called KL, and part of my role is a, a technical role, as well as sales, and I'm going to say I'm probably the nerd of the company. Uh, um, don't know if it should be a good thing or a, or a bad thing. Um, and within this role that I do go out on site and calibrate people's monitors and give them you know some tutorials on how to actually um, work through you know getting the best out of the, not only their monitor but printer. So uh, part of that is I've been uh, printing for many years. I've been around since uh, one of the first digital inkjet printers have come out. Um, which was actually the Epson Stylus Color, which was a four color inkjet printer way back in the day. Um, and that was one of the things that we faced many, many years ago was that our screens never matched our inkjet printers. And ever since then, I've been you know, enjoying the world of color and printing. Oh, you can, oh, sorry, I can hear just. Do you want me to a little bit closer? Sorry. Um, so again, sorry, this is uh, where we'll, what we'll do is we'll go through some of the settings. What I want to try and do is some bit of demos as well. Um, I've got some slides. I've kept the slides very basic with some tips and this is also being recorded. So if there is something that um, we do go through and then in say a month's time you happen to forget, you can, uh, you'll be able to get it down from like places like YouTube and so on. The other thing is thank you for joining as well while the um, state of origin happens to be on. Um, I only got found out not that long ago <laughs> that we we're hosting the webinar on the same night. So again, if uh, Queensland happens to score a try, um, please don't tell me about it. Alright, so let's go on to the next slide. One of the first things I'd like to do from the webinars that we've had with Peter and um, Matt Granger, I wanted to get some, I've got some polls going throughout this webinar tonight to give us some feedback, not just myself, but Peter and the guys at Data Colour. Um, and you, you guys are our customers, so we want to hear what you have to say. Um, some of my questions at the end are a little bit direct, but don't feel, um, please give it an honest answer because we want to know we're doing the right thing by you guys as well, yeah? So the first one I'm going to ask is, uh, what calibrator do you guys use? Now that is, I'm going to click launch. And you guys should now be seeing the webinar on the screen. I'll give it a little bit of time. Okay. Most of you guys have voted. So, okay, that's great. About 20% Spider 4. About 50% Spider 3. Oh, there's a couple of Spider 2 users. Well, hopefully for the Spider 3 and 2 users, this will help you um, possibly go to a, a Spider 4, but um, let's go through. Wow, 20% don't actually have one. Well, guys, hopefully today, if you've got any questions, please ask. Um, that's what I'm here for. And, okay, cool, some x right users as well. I'll leave this up for a little bit. And it's just me navigating this tonight by myself. I'm the Lone Ranger. So um, it does make it a bit harder to uh, monitor all this stuff. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now. And let's move on to the next slide, which is um, what type of photographer uh, would best describe you? Um, you know, you're just sort of starting out. Are you a hobbyist? 
uh, you're semi-professional, like so starting to make some money, uh, professional. And the other one is videographer. Um, I did start out in video myself uh, when I was probably about 13 years old. So, and no one's picked video. <laughs> Great stuff. So that's good. That this is helping us then know how what else we can do later on in webinar series for you guys. All right, excellent. Thank you. All right. I'm going to close this poll off now. All right, so let's move on. You guys can see my screen fairly okay and so on. Um, I'm assuming that we can. Yep, thank you for the feedback. So one of the common questions that I get asked by a lot of people from whether we've been at the digital show, uh, that's the trade show that happens annually, through to just, you know, people are like they call into our showroom and the, the guys in the showroom get me to give them like people a call. I've been using I'm like yeah, I have been using a data colour products uh, since the Spider Two, which was back in the day of the old CRT monitors and the very early L C D monitors. And it was a good product. Um, Later, I'm going to say that there has always been improvement. So, the Spider 2, um, they all use seven filters, but it had a very small aperture, 15 millimeters, compared to the 27. So that means when we talk things like accuracy of actually reading color, um, it, it it was accurate, but not as accurate as what the Spider 3, and then so on, like to the Spider 4. And the software took a very long time to calibrate. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it, it was a thing that you'd have to set out a good half an hour of your day to actually go through and calibrate the monitor. Then the Spider 3 came along, and this was well before I worked at KL. Um, I remember rushing out as soon as I saw that it took five minutes, or rushing down to KL and actually buying this, and it was a massive improvement. Um, a lot quicker, a lot more accurate, and it was something that um, made a big difference. And then. Spider 3 actually had what we call version 4 software come out about three years ago. Um, and this then allowed, again, uh, some other improvements such as what we call iteratively gray balancing the screen. And also um, it allowed things like iPhone and iPad calibration. Now, moving from the Spider 3 to what we call the Spider 4, there's been a major change in what we call the filters, um, still seven filters, but they've actually been multi-coded for a longer life because these actually, all these, uh, the Spider 3 and the Spider 2, uh, used a very similar filter, but it was a what we call like an organic filter. So eventually over time they do degrade. Now, um, you know, we could be taught, like there's been actually no life given to me on how long it, um, you know, uh, like the degree, like what we call the degradation of the filter. But I'd be saying it would be about sort of three years, maybe sort of four years. Um, and look, I can remember paying about $700 for my Spider 2 way back in the day. And from my point of view as a, a photographer and doing video, that all the money that I spent on monitors and printers and so on like that, it was a smaller, uh, well, it was still quite expensive then. When the Spider 3 came out, it was a lot cheaper. It was something that I valued a lot. Um, and now that you know the Spider 4 out, and it is, you'll see later on, we've got some uh, good little incentives. Um, it does make it a, a better product um, and cheaper. So it is something that I do say to people, in the grand scheme of things, they are um, you know, a very good investment to buy. Uh, now, you can also see that they're also more accurate, and this is how they've also been able to, um, well, sorry, the Spider 4 is more accurate than the Spider 3, and this is from the actual uh, algorithms and the software and the sensors that they use, or the, what we call the color emitter inside the Spider. So the Spider 3, Spider 4, same shape, but the Spider 4 just happens to be black. The Spider 3 was that nice, uh, shiny silver. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Now, one of the things that we do, or I get, again get asked is, should I go for the Express, the Pro, or the Elite? And I've brought, I've brought this sort of slide up to try and make it a bit easier for people to understand. Myself, I tend to try and say to a lot of people, if they're looking at the Express, to spend that little bit more money, or if they can 
if they don't have the money straight away, maybe to hold off a little bit and go to the Pro because the Express is fixed. It can only do a gamma of 2.2 and it can only do 6500 Kelvin, which can be fine for some people. So if you're uh, you know, starting out in photography, you just need to make sure your screen's sort of calibrated, then it, it can be a, um, a good starting point for, I think, what the Spider Express is about the $130 mark. I can actually bring that up on screen. Give me a tick. Uh, we get calibration. Sorry, just give me a tick. And yeah, as I say, but uh, it is. 169. Sorry, um, but it can only uh, it can only actually calibrate one single screen. So as photographers, we tend to end up getting dual screens as we progress because we need more space, especially when Photoshop happens to take up a lot of uh, rooms with its palettes and even Lightroom. So then again, the Express cannot do what we call multiple displays displays, and it can even it can't even be upgraded to. The soft, like the higher versions of the software of the Pro and the Elite. The hardware between all three of them is exactly the same. It's just the software and the software, what it can do. So this is why I say the Pro is a good starting point. Um, again, you've got control over your gamma. You can go 1.8 to 2.2, uh, 2.4. You do have some fixed white points, so 500 Kelvin, 58 and 6500 Kelvin. And you do only have three brightness modes compared to the Elite where you've got, I'm going to say, well, it is, it's unlimited control. And I'll show you this a little bit later on. You can do multiple um, multiple screens with the Pro, but the Elite, you can do projectors. Both the Pro and the Elite can be upgraded to what we call the Spider TV, which is a piece of software that uh, has images or uh, colored slides on DVDs and Blu-ray discs that you put into your computer, uh, DVD player or um, Blu-ray player and you actually calibrate your TV. Now, if you happen to be driving your TV from your laptop, you don't need Spider TV. You can use either the Spider Pro or the Spider Elite and treat the TV just like an external uh, computer monitor. Now, this upgrade is also an extra cost, but it can be purchased at any time after you uh, purchase the Pro or the Elite, or if you if you need that um, there. All right, let's move on. Now, this is where really the you can see the Express hasn't got any of these features like what the Pro and the Elite does. So, in the Pro, there's a thing what we call monitor quality analysis (MQA). Now the Pro it is a bit limited compared to the Elite where it does have a lot more uh, features. Um, the Elite also has a thing called Studio Match. So again, if you happen to be using dual screens, you can actually allow them to uh, get a much closer match to each other. And then there's also a thing called Spider Tune in the Elite where what the Spider Tune allows is that data color don't know your room lighting. So if you happen to be viewing a print and it happens to be under, I don't know, tungsten lighting, we can actually just do a bit of a tweak in the software to help show how that print's going to be reflected in this uh, room lighting. So in my little office here at home, um, you know, I have daylight globes, so therefore it doesn't matter where I look in the room, it's uh, correct, correct uh, lighting for viewing prints. The other thing that the Elite allows, and this is something that I actually use for when I'm doing video, is um, a field, what we call um, calibration of field monitors. So I can actually balance on my uh, video cameras the little LCD uh, screen. So then when I'm actually out there recording, I'm sort of getting a better uh, idea. Now, I'm going to ask some questions later on, but uh, for devices, for people that are into video, you've got now the new Atomus Ninja where you can actually put the spider on top of it with a special type of cable and calibrate these field monitors directly. So when you're recording from your D800 video or 5D Mark III into this Atomus device, you can then make sure your field monitor is the right uh, video standard for color. The other the other feature, and this is one thing I did like when the, the 3 and the 4 came on, and then when the 4 came out with this, it's called the quick cal check. So each month when we're going through and calibrating, we don't actually have to um, go through and do the whole five minutes. What we can do is it can go and do some measurements because it's already taken the measurement the first time we've done this calibration, 
and say, here we are. Like it knows the reference points. It looks at those reference points and sees is there a change. And if there's a big enough change, it will bring up a message saying, please recalibrate me. And then you go through and do the full calibration. If there isn't a change and the, it's been quite stable, then it just says pass and then you don't need to go through that five minute process. And again, this is one thing that the Elite does have over the Pro, which is the what we call iterative grey balance. Um, and this is again doing great for doing black and white uh, images. So if you happen to be doing a lot of black and white printing, you can really fine tune how black and whites look on your screen and uh, sometimes get rid of that slight color cast that can come through. All right. So these are sort of the tips that I've brought over the years. Um, but before I go through, I just wanted to ask a question. What type of camera do you use? Um, again, as I was uh, saying earlier on that I was going to ask some um, questions. And again, this is just helping us trying to get some feedback. Um, and again, please feel, thank you uh, for taking the time to answer these questions because it gives us a lot more information and how to work. Um, so that poll should have launched. And if you guys want to go through, wow. That's great. 74% of the people have voted. Oh, almost done. No one's done all of the above. <laughs> no, that's great. Oh, yeah. I put film in there just to see if anyone was still shooting film because I happen to still bring out the old film camera. Um, still sitting on my desk here at the moment. I've got a, a nice Hasselblad film camera that I'd love to shoot with. But dear Salah, that was the winner. So that's great because... Um, I'll just close the poll off now. That will help me. Um, <laughs> thank you for the person that owned up for using film bodies. Um, it, 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 it's something that it will help me in the later on because I want to try and do this hopefully each month, come through and give you some tips on um, not just using a data color product but maybe other things and this is something that I would like to get some feedback on. All right, let's step through. So one of the common ones I get asked is, what sort of settings should I use? So I've got two slides. This is the first one. You can see here uh, I've got it listed as photo labs and what sort of settings for the photo labs to use. Now you'll notice under brightness I have a star next to them. This is a bit of a variable. Um, if we talk most office lighting, generally it tends to be about 120 candelas, but there are some great pro labs out there where they'll actually have a, a, a much um, dimmer work area and therefore we don't need as bright monitor and so therefore what we need to do is actually have our monitor brightness of about um, 80 candelas. Now, so let's start off with photo labs. So 6500 Kelvin, the reason why we pick 6500 Kelvin is when we're using papers with optical brightness in it, so such as Epson Premium uh, Semi-Gloss or Epson Premium Luster, um, you know, Canson uh, Photo Satin and so on, these have an optical brightness, so they tend to be quite blue-white or what we call a blue-white paper. And that's sort of a, a very sort of similar look. Uh, so I happen to know that some of the papers like Epsom Luster tends to have a white point of about 6100 Kelvin. That's getting very technical, but 65 would be close enough to use there. Always a gamma of uh, 2.2. Some labs might ask for a gamma of 1.1. So again, you can see with the Express, we couldn't change that, but with at least the Pro and the Elite, we could set our what we call monitor gamma to 1.8 to match that lab if we happen to be using them a lot. Uh, again, the brightness um, might make it a, a bit harder, but um, this is sometimes where, again, if you've got a good Pro lab, you could ask them to do a test print, or well, they might have an image that's a test print. I was going to cover this off a little bit later on where you could then get that test print sent to you, bring it up on the screen, and then if your monitor brightness, you start off at 120, and then bring it down to say 100, then 90, then 80, and then you might say, okay, it was 85. Now, the Elite, you can actually dial that in. Now, the reason why we want to try and set our black point is actually what we call our contrast. Now, uh, monitor manufacturers, like you know, LG or Dell or someone like that, you know, they make these really nice monitors that happen to have like a contrast ratio of 10,000 to 1. But unfortunately, our printers can't reproduce that. Um, you know, it, it's very hard that you even get a printer reproducing 300 to 1. So what we do is we find our candelas. So let's say, for instance, in this instance, 80 candelas, and then we divide it by 0 0.04. 
and that will give us a contrast ratio of 200 to 1, which is for like most fine art papers and most photo papers. And again, you can see that those settings are pretty much copied right across home photo printing. So if you happen to have like a little desktop printer like uh, an Epson Artisan printer or an Epson 3880, um, these are sort of the settings. And you'll be able to do this a lot quicker than obviously having to wait for a print to come back from a lab. And, and when I'm talking these sort of pro labs, it's not the ones that you tend to find in most consumer electronics uh, stores. It tends to be, I'm going to say, more the pro labs. Uh, so I'm based here in Sydney. Um, I don't know where everyone is based, but in Sydney we've got things like uh, Pixel Perfect, Vision Lab, um, in Newcastle there's Belmont Photo and Pro Am. Uh, you know, there's a lot around that um, people can use. Let's skip through to the next slide and I'll show you some of the ones for the fine art printing. So we can see in fine art printing I've got the white point at 5800 Kelvin so that's more of that yellowy sort of toned to match again the paper that we're running with. Um, when we put a fine art paper like a Canson Rag Photographique or a BFK or Epson's hot press or cold press, they tend to be quite yellow. You put it against a paper that I said earlier, like a Epson Premium Luster or a Canson Satin, uh, the Canson Satin is very blue compared to this. So we don't want our screen very blue um, because then all of a sudden we can see a huge color shift when we're doing things like soft proofing. Again, the gamma is the same. If we're talking, this, if we were doing this webinar six years ago and you're using an Apple, uh, early Apple, so something that was running what we call 10.5, we'd have the gamma at 1.8. But now that uh, Apple since 10.6 and higher, so 7, uh, 10.8, 7, sorry, 10.7, 10.8 and 10.9, we've all been using a gamma of 2.2 and this goes the same with Windows as well. Um, and then again the black point, that should actually be 0.04 or um, 0.05 again, we, it's just divide that your black point by uh, doing this. And the only spider that you can actually adjust the black point on is the Elite. The the Pro has got a black adjust a black point luminance, but you can't actually set it. Now, if you happen to be only just producing, say, images for web, um, and you don't do any type of printing, then yeah, 6500 Kelvin, gamma 2.2. Again, a brightness um, anywhere from say 100, 120. You could even go lower depending on your room lighting. And again, that's the hardest variable. I can't see everyone, so uh, I can only take a, a bit of a stab in the the dark of um, what the average room should be. And then a black point to zero because you can. Um, the reason why again we're lifting up the black point is that inkjet printers or even uh, labs can't get a true zero 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 black. Um, but if you're only doing for web, where uh, we're uploading images to Flickr, Facebook, and so on, they can produce a zero, zero, zero black point. All right, let's move on. Now, I've broken these uh, down to very quick points, also to give me a reminder what to talk about, and also for you to uh, consider. One thing um, is monitor hoods. Now, monitor hoods stop what we call direct light falling on the screen, and, you know, Look, KL do sell them. They're about $88 for um, one that will go around pretty much any monitor up to about 24 inch and you can buy dual screen ones for when you've got bigger screens. But it stops what we call monitor flaring. Now, I actually haven't asked this in the poll, but how many people tend are using IMAX? You know, the people that are using IMAX, these glossy screen IMAX and some of the other ones coming out by other manufacturers now, you can see reflection sometimes in them. Um, and I happen to know that someone in this uh, webinar at the moment does actually have an iMac. Um, they, they, you can see the reflection. You can see what colour T-shirt you're wearing, and that be, that can be because we're not blocking off any uh, light. We're getting direct light falling onto it, and happens to be coming out in our shirts, reflecting back onto the monitor. So, look. Even a simple bit of polystyrene around the monitor, um, obviously coated black or something like that will help or a piece of cardboard might not look the best for when people come around, but um, it is something definitely I encourage people to put uh, around their screens. Um, the next thing is that a new monitor, and when I mean a new monitor, it's like brand new out of the box. 
that you've just picked it up today, for instance, calibrate it weekly for about the first month, maybe the first two months, because they do take a while to settle down. And once they're what we call burnt in, then you can go to calibrating once a month. Now, people tend to ask me, um, I'm sorry, I was just watching a message pop up. Uh, people tend to ask me um, that when do I actually calibrate? Well, I happen to get paid monthly. So <laughs> how I remind myself as well as having the data color pop up and remind me to calibrate is I base it around when I get paid. So the weekend after I normally get paid, I go through and calibrate on the weekend because um, you know, I've got a couple of monitors here um, and I've I'll just make sure that they're all within specification. And again, it doesn't take me a very long time to do. Um, just I go through the quick, uh, quick cow check and then I'm done. Um, for monitors that have calibration, uh, or sorry, inbuilt calibration support, this is something like what we call the ASO CG or uh, CX models or the NEC panels. Use their software to use the heart. If you've got, uh, say, an ASO monitor that doesn't have an inbuilt calibrator, use the spider as the hardware but use their software to calibrate the monitor because you'll actually be talking directly to the monitor itself and one thing i do try and encourage people is that in this uh in the software there's a thing called the monitor quality analysis feature now it's probably i'm going to say a very overlooked tool and what this allows us to do is for when we are using monitors like this, uh, someone that's just brought up a message about using MacBook Pro, we can actually check how continuous tone the screen is. And the easiest way of checking it yourself now before um, you know, going and running the software is just bring up a, a neutral gray on screen uh, in say Photoshop, go full screen and you might find that around the edges it could be a little bit green tinged and so on. I happen to know someone with a 30 inch uh, Apple screen and on one half of it it's got a green cast and then the other half is fairly neutral but using the tool we're actually able to plot out exactly um, where the most accurate part of the monitor was. And so I was just having going to have a kick read of these questions. Uh, sorry give me a tick. Uh, so to Nicholas Yes, you can use DVI on one monitor and then use HDMI on the other. Just be mindful, of guys, of uh, HDMI outputs of even some uh, laptops. They don't put out the same resolution of, not resolution, sorry, what we call color bit depth as what DVI or DisplayPort does. So um, what I'd probably do in your case, Nicholas, what would probably be to... Um, have my what I call non-serious monitor, so it might be just my email monitor through HDMI because it's not going to make a big difference to color, but then my main screen that I'm doing my retouching on, say off the, the laptop or, or computer, would be then my one going through DVI and that actually then allows for a more um, specification there. Um, for the yes, there's a person that happens to be using a MacBook Pro, and they have got their room painted black. Um, I'm going to say you're very lucky because my wife would shoot me if I did that. Uh, sorry, give me a tick. Uh, can you go through? Okay, so do you wrap the screen when calibrating? Yes. So the question was, can you go through? The, um, what you do for IMAX again. I don't understand. Uh, that's fine. Do you wrap the screen when you're calibrating? So what I tend to do with the IMAX, uh, if I'm going out on site and doing calibrations or I get support calls, is the IMAX, because of the glossy screen that they have on front, on the front of the screen, the extra bit of glass to make them look nice and uh, deep, rich colour, is that that extra bit of glass can allow for what we call side light coming in. And if we talked if we talk again in the dark ages where we used to use those old CRT monitors, again they used to have very thick glass panels on the, the front of the tube and that's why people used to always say when you calibrate turn your room light off uh, because, or turn the lights off in the room so you stopped any what we call side light because uh, light doesn't just pass straight through glass, it can bounce around before it goes through. So the common trick I find is uh, if I happen, to, well, it's winter at the moment, so a nice thick black uh, polar fleece jumper 
I just hang over the monitor and over the spider. So I line everything up, uh, get it to the point where it gets, uh, it says to the click start to calibrate. I, I hang, then put the t-shirt over and because I haven't moved the mouse, I click start and wait about five or six minutes to let the calibration go through and then normally come back and uh, lift it up and it's completed. So that's um, something there. You might find that that's how you can actually improve getting some colors out of these uh, MacBook retinas and also the iMacs. The MacBook's very easy because it, it's a lot smaller than these 27 inch iMacs, but it's something that can really help with getting better quality. And again, that's why I'd probably say things like at least the Pro and the Elite will help that. Now, unfortunately for the people that are using MacBooks and uh, iMacs, um, you can't adjust what we call the RGB levels. So maybe for the person that was using the um, DVI and HDMI setup, the monitor that we could be using, like on my desk, I happen to, I'm very lucky, I've got two ASOs at the moment on my desk, um, and I can actually adjust what we call the red, blue, and green levels of the individual LCD panel. And so that makes it, again, for a much more um, accurate, what we call like a neutralization of the screen. So with an iMac, because it, uh, the software will know, okay, you can't adjust for these settings, it builds in what we call a compensation into the profile it makes, it puts onto your video card. But if we have a monitor, like even some of these cheap, uh, I'm going to say BenQs, the very cheap monitors, they'll have those settings. Now, another point that I've come across uh, in the, probably the last 12 months, I won't name the monitor manufacturer because I don't think it's nice for me to do this, but um, there happens to be one monitor manufacturer at the moment that was pitching monitors to photographers and you'd go through and do all these custom settings to do with uh, balancing your RGB and balancing your brightness of your monitor. You'd turn the monitor off and then turn it back on and it would lose all of its settings and you'd have to do it again. Um, unfortunately, it was the according to the monitor manufacturer, that's how they designed the monitor. So um, unfortunately now, uh, I, I just, if I can't, yeah, I, I was quite shocked when they rang me and said that that's quite normal. Um, it's one that I, um, KL doesn't sell, so I'm quite happy about it. But I got the phone call from a customer asking about it. Now, the next thing is let your monitor warm up before doing your calibration. So if you happen to start work at say 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, and you get in at say 8.30, turn the monitor on, go and make a coffee, um, do whatever, let it warm up, and then at 9 o'clock run your uh, calibration. One of the big points I tend to uh, really try and stress is uh, keeping the screen clean, because if you've got, I don't know what happens over time, you know, little marks and, you know, stuff on the screen itself, and then we put the sensor over the top, that can affect the quality of this, the read coming uh, to the dark, like to the, the spider. So again, it's something that uh, I would do try and say to people is just simple clean before you do the um, calibration and then that will make it go through there. Now, the next thing is having a, uh, having a control test image. So here's two that I just Googled earlier today. Um, most of you guys will probably see this. Uh, sorry, someone's asking. No, it doesn't have four letters. Um, they have a very long name uh, that, that don't save those settings. Um, sorry, back to the control image though. Is uh, If you guys want to Google, just type in uh, when you're in Google next time, P for Peter, D for Doug, I for Igloo test image. And that will bring up this one here on the left-hand side with the four babies that everyone knows. Um, back in the old film day, oh, sorry, wet lab days, we used to call it a Shirley image because it used to be a, a female and she just got named Shirley and it stuck. Um, and we'd always print that out as a test image. This one's actually quite a nice one as well because it actually shows us a ramp. Now, I'd be interested to see how many people can see all the long hair uh, appearing and same with the white. Um, I'm just curious what happens with my video feed uh, coming through GoToMeeting. Um, yeah, because all my screens are calibrated. I'm just curious to see what you guys would see. But this is something that I really strongly suggest. Um, if you're going to a lab, the, the this PDI test image on the left-hand side is a commercially free image, so you can't sell it, but you are allowed to print it. So you can send it to your lab, 
and get them to print it for you, get it back, and then they won't make any adjustments to this, and then you can compare it to how your calibration is on screen, and if you need to use something like the Spider Tune in the Elite to get that better setting, but also um, you know, to check your room light, because again, you can walk out the doors, the skin tones look great on the, the kids on the bottom, then come in indoors, and then you might find that the room that you're in can be quite warm and making all the skin tones look very warm, and if you happen to be using your own desktop printer, then that can explain why you might be getting some extra warmth happening there. Hopefully I'm not going too fast, guys, if you need to uh, you know, yell out at me um, to go through. So someone's asking, are these test images reliable? Yes, um, they are. Like a, it, It's probably been the one, it used to actually come on a, a thing called the photo disc where it was before iStock was around, you used to uh, subscribe to a company that used to send you monthly CDs with very high resolution images. This is something that I'm going to say a lot of people go to. You've got your color checker chart here in the middle. If you can see my mouse cursor, let me just zoom in. Uh, you can see here we've got the color checker chart. So these are known, you know, skin tone values here. These happen to be uh, blue oceans and sky. Here's a gradient. So if uh, your lab is a, a, what I call a pro lab, they will normally know not to adjust this image. Um, you, they'll tend to actually print it correctly. Um, I've actually I had a customer recently print one of these and they said when they took this image in to get printed at the lab, um, the guy suddenly went through and did his linearizations. And this wasn't a, a pro lab, unfortunately. This was a, a consumer sort of a very basic lab. And um, they were saying that it was interesting to see the guy actually go through because it all almost like he got caught out. Yep, um, there you are, Stephen. Yes, that one. There's many around. Uh, you've got Bill Atkins's um, image there as well. So this is something that I have in my, I'm going to say, uh, arsenal of um, weaponry for doing things with colour management. If uh, anyone happens to be um, in Sydney and wants to drop into the KL showroom, a um, bit of a plug for the boss, you know, I don't know if he's listening, um, there is a wall that is in the back of our showroom where it has the same image, not that uh, PDI test image, it's another e test image uh, that we've made where it's been printed on all the different types of paper through an Epson printer so people can actually compare papers, um, same ink set but on just different papers and it's something that um, again you can make your own test image, uh, you could make it with have the, the PDI test image and then a couple of your own. I do have my own set so I have that uh, image as well as a black and white landscape, a colour landscape, a um, black and white portrait and a colour portrait and they never change, I don't adjust them because we've got to remember the reason why I use the te PDI test image first is that we're an emotional creature so to speak or being I should say and when we've taken an image sometimes like we've got the vivid uh, Sydney thing going on at the moment, the light show on at Sydney, uh, Darling Harbour and sometimes we could capture an image thinking it was perfect, then get it back, import it to the computer, and we may have had the uh, exposure incorrect. And rather than think our monitor is um, displaying the image correctly, we might actually think the monitor is displaying the image incorrectly because we thought what we did was capture it correctly. So this just helps it move it out there. Um, I was just going to, sorry, give me two tickets. I do too. Uh, were the, uh, Michael, were you asking if the images were printed in the showroom on the 3880 by any chance? I'll wait for you to come back with that one. Um, no, they're in the showroom they're actually printed on an Epson 4900. Uh, took me about two months to do, but it's something there. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry, Michael, I haven't started the um, poll. Let me just start, launch this poll. That was my error. So guys, if you could um, select through uh, if you own your own printer, because what I'd like to do again later on, if you guys uh, would want, and time being and so on, is you know if people have their own printer, is it worth me doing a webinar? So these are why I'm sort of trying to do the, again the polls. While we're waiting for the poll to run.
Yes, you can just Google P for Peter, yep, Doug, uh, D for Doug, I for Igloo test image into Google, and then you know how Google has web pages and then a thing saying image search, click on image search, and then you'll see a lot of people bringing those up. All right, I'll close the poll off here because most of us are all voted. Uh, just to let you know, 26% uh, 20, of you uh, use professional photo labs. Only 4% of you do photo books, which is quite interesting. I thought it might be a little bit higher. Wow, 30% use your own desktop printer. 28% uh, 20, all of above. Wow, great. Um, and 11% don't print. Um, is that just, I might ask for the people that don't print, is that just because you happen to um, be starting out? Because I noticed there were some uh, earlier entry level people before. Oh, well, well, that's good to go. Thanks, guys, for doing giving that feedback because that will really help uh, later on down the track if you would want me to do something with the spider print or just more on uh, color workflow. Okay, that's cool. So, yeah, you go anything larger, larger than A3 plus goes to a lap. That's great to know. Oh, and that's good to know, Stephen. So, thank you for that feedback. Um, now, this is the next thing I've got to really say. You've heard me before say, um, consider use, or talking about daylight globes. The other one is control the room lighting. Uh, one of the things that the data color uh, spider three and four do over the two um, is a thing called ambient light. And I'll just zoom in on the um, spider for you quickly. Sorry guys, I don't think it allows me to move it. No, unfortunately it doesn't allow me to move it. But see this little white dot that I happen to be drawing my uh, little mouse cursor over? Uh, that is what we call the ambient light meter. So mine currently connected into computer is flashing blue at me. And what it does is when we've calibrated the monitor, uh, it takes a room reading and notes how bright our room is. Then we can set up whether it measures light every 15 minutes, every hour, every minute, and it looks for any changes in the external lighting and then brings up a warning pardon me, sorry, uh, it brings up a warning if the um, room lighting has changed. So it's a, a, a good feature, like a, a, not trying to get too nerdy on you guys, but there happens to be an um, institution in the States, a very big museum, that actually have um, their staff uh, in grey jumpsuits, grey walls, uh, they wear hood, they can't wear any jewellery, and they have little light sensors on the light monitors and uh, all around the place measuring if there's any changes because these guys are trying to uh, photograph um, artworks and reproduce artworks so they have to make sure the colors like the, there's no external factors that can be um, what's the word I'm looking for here affecting the quality of output so um, to give you guys an idea my uh, office faces faces easterly I happen to have a very nice view of a park. Now, um, if I'm doing colour critical work, like for ready for printing or award printing or something like that, um, this is something that uh, I'd say to people is that I I'll draw my blind shut and make sure there's no external light that can affect it and then I work with daylight globes on through the whole time that I'm working. If I happen to be reading email, doing just you know, watching a DVD or something like that, yeah, I'll open up the blinds and I'm happy to look outside. But it is something that this can affect our um, quality. So if you happen to be you know, in Manly and you've got that nice beach view, um, then that can go through and actually, um, yeah, you, you want to try and control that room. So you can see here, this is a, an image from uh, GTI who makes a lighting booth. Um, and again, uh, no direct light falling on the man here uh, or on the actual monitor itself. And then this is actually what we call uh, a daylight uh, viewing booth. For Hans, you, your, to answer your question, does the spider need to be connected all the time to do the ambient light read? Yes, it does. Um, if you've got control over your room lighting, as in, I don't know, let's say we're in a basement where we've got no light coming in, then you wouldn't need to have the spider connected in there because your room uh, writing is not going to be changing. And again, Data Colour have put this into the product um, because we're dealing with all walks of life without sounding rude. We're going from the very high-end professional who might have control over this sort of stuff all the way through to, again, an entry-level photographer. So um, from 
if you have got that control, then no, you don't need it connected in. Oh, I just have mine connected in for tonight. Um, a lot of the time, again, I know what my room does, and if I've got the blind shut for when I'm doing the work that I need to do, then um, I know my room's correct. But um, yeah, maybe for you guys, yeah, it might be something. Yeah, just keep an eye out through the day, and the software will tell you how, like, if it's gone what we call poor, so very dark, or very, um, very bright, and it will say very high. And then one thing that can actually be overlooked is color casts can actually come from room, uh, the room that you're in. So if you happen to be um, having a very bright wall or a very bright wall behind the monitor, that can actually affect your perceptual view of the not just the screen, but even your print as well. So not that I'm saying to run out and paint. Um, the room months or grey. Um, I don't want to be shot by the significant other others, um, but just keep that in mind. Um, I've had it before uh, again where we, we I've got a, a friend of mine where they actually have um, I'm going to say very bad colour casts in the room. So we have uh, a thing like this little uh, GTI booth and. Um, and what that does is it just eliminates any color casts falling onto the print, and also they have a hood, which um, helps you know uh, minimize this problem for them. Is it all sort of making sense, guys? Hopefully it is. It looks like some good uh, things coming through. Now this is one thing I really wanted to show you tonight, and I've got it running in the background at the moment. Is Photoshop and uh, Photoshop CC? They changed the uh, they changed the interface from remember when it was that dull grey drab to this nice new black sexy look. Looks great, but unfortunately that can actually affect our perception of uh, our images on the screen. And uh, here we are again, um, same with Lightroom 4 and 5. When they brought in soft proofing mode, they actually had um, it turned on to show white, which again can actually make the print look darker than what it was on screen. So. Uh, Again, we've got to change this, and I'll show you how to do this. And unfortunately, guys, us being photographers, you know, we love to have our nice uh, images of our our work on our desktop. Well, unfortunately, if we don't have Photoshop or Lightroom in full screen mode, um, and we have say blue from a, a landscape or a seascape coming through, that can also affect our our perception of the image that we're working on at the moment. So, either. Um, again, you can see with my desktop, and if I, um, oops, sorry about that, exit out of um, full screen mode of the presentation, you can see here that I've got a you know, very bland, very boring, um, yeah, grey gray screen. So one question uh, I'm going to ask, and I won't keep this one up for too long, is what webinar day, what days suit you guys for webinars? Like tonight, obviously state of origin night, so apologies for that and thank you for uh, joining in and staying in the room. Um, but yeah, uh, what nights, I've been thinking it's Monday and Tuesday, but oh wow, it's actually Wednesday is um, coming through. Wow, well, yeah, Sunday, that's fine. Cool, thanks guys. Most of you all voted there. All right, I'm going to close this off. 90%. Excellent. Oh, that's good to know. So I'm going to say the day is Wednesday. So this is something good. So now when um, I'm talking to the guys like Peter and Matt organizing the next one coming up, then um, we know that we might try and put it on a Wednesday night. Then we actually thought I actually thought personally myself Monday or Tuesday, but it, it looks like you guys have spoken, so um, we might try that the next time around. All right, so let's go through to the next slide. So for the guys that happen to be using the Spider Two, the Spider Threes, so whether that's the Elite, the Express, or the Pro in the Spider Three, or the Fighter Spider Four Express, or even an X Right product. Um, we're going to offer using the code on KL's website, so it's KL Australia. I'll give you that web link a little bit later in this next slide. Um, you'll get thirty percent off, and that will um, go through till the end of June. With that, but when you're actually in the shopping cart online, please put your dongle number in, and I'll show you actually how to find your dongle number in the Spider Three and uh, Spider Two software. Um, if you can put that in, and same for the X-Rite users. So this might hopefully um, 
encourage you know some people that are using the threes and the uh, twos to jump through because it's thirty percent off what our website is. So it's quite a I'm going to say significant saving. So before I um, bring up all the like the last slide, let me uh, bring up Photoshop first of all, and I'm going to show you one thing. So here's the Photoshop interface for CS6 and uh, CC, and here we are. This is the the um, very dark grey or the black sort of uh, background, which again um, looks nice and sexy, but is probably not the best for printing. So it's very, very easy to change. All we have to do is click on, oh, I'm on a Mac, uh, as you can see. Um, I come down into Preferences and it's the same, Windows is uh, fairly the same. I believe it's under Edit and then in Preferences. I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong. And then we just come into interface and select interface and we just select this one here and then voila. This is the um, screen and you can see I have my Photoshop in what I call the, the full mode. And so when I bring images in it doesn't even really matter about the desktop behind here. But again just to keep that continuity when I'm clicking between say Photoshop and another application. I'm trying to keep as much neutral grey happening. So there we are. That's um, Photoshop there. And I'll just scroll down because I've seen some messages come through. Yes, so you can download the PDI test image. Uh, or, sorry, you have downloaded the PDI test image. Yes, and you can print it through Photoshop. And you can uh, print it through Illustrator as well. Illustrator will be a little bit um, a different. Uh, Actually, no, it should be the same because it's an RGB document. If it, you brought it into a CMYK document, you can see a change. Ah, so new, no new disk. What we might get to do, Stephen, um, in regards to your question, if you want to contact us directly, um, we should be able to work something out there for you. All right. I'm just going to bring up Lightroom now. And I wanted to show you where it is in Lightroom. So here we are, I've got the image in Lightroom uh, already preloaded. And I'm going to go into the develop module. And this is probably I'm going to be saying that uh, since Lightroom 4 came out with this, which was called soft proofing, it's been uh, one of my, um, oh, the file not found because I've moved it on the desktop, um, probably one of my happiest features because Photoshop was the only one of the only applications that had soft proofing. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you guys know what um, like uh, software uh, soft proofing does? Um, it's something I'm just going to explain it really quickly, which is it allows us to proof how it's going to look on our printer before we print it. So we're actually saving on paper and ink and time and and so on. So what we do to get to the soft proofing mode is this little checkbox here. We tick that. And there we are. You can see that here's the default, and this is just Lightroom 5 that I um, in like have been running, or sorry, a new catalog. You can see it's white, and that can affect how visually this image looks on screen. So what I uh, do is all you do is right click, and this is again the same for Mac and uh, PC. Right click, and then see how it has paper white. I'll change it to say 50% grey. So again very similar to Photoshop so I'm not having a huge change on my eyes and then when I come over to this section in Photoshop where I then select um, there's for my 7900 using rag I can then actually see how uh, colors and hopefully my computer doesn't lock up now so I've got the wheel of death that how the colors change so I can sit there and um, I don't know if you guys can see this actually happening on screen. So this is sometimes with the webinars you don't see how soft proofing really works. So it's something that, um, yeah, and again if you've got a lab that you're using for the people that are using labs, um, you know, ask them if they have got printer profiles that they can share with you so you can then do things like this. So they might already have an instruction set on how to calibrate your monitor or what settings to use for your monitor and then tie it in that with a profile for their uh, printers and the papers that they're printing on. All right, so I'm just going to minimize this one down for you and minimize that down. Now, 
that's all right. Disappear. Let me just have a look through. I'm just going to read some questions here. Hi, Luke. I'm keen to upgrade to the Spider 4. I use a 3880 printer and two ASOs. Okay, cool. Thank you for that support. Um, yes, you can. Um, again, if you want to get the guys, give the showroom a call and they can put you in contact with me or I'll show up a little bit later with me as well. To print the test image, which paper may you suggest? <laughs> this is, I'm going to say the, yeah, so to print the test image, which paper you suggest is the paper that you you want to print your work on. Um, I'm going to say, look, I, I get a bit privileged and I do have access to some of the best paper in the world. Um, but yeah, when I'm trying out any new paper type, I'll, I'll print that test image. That becomes my control image and I'll, I'll again compare it to other papers. So someone might say, hey Luke, can you have a look at this paper or print a series of work on this paper? Well, uh, the first thing I bring up is before I bring up my own test images, I bring up the t PDI test image and actually print it. And um, that's then not because I've already got known papers that I really love and work with. Um, then this happens to be then a good control a control point for me, yeah, if that makes sense. But if you, there's so many different you know, papers around, uh, I've got to say, guys, if you're into doing some uh, really fine art sort of papers, like paper that's been made for the last 400 odd years, check out the Canson range. Um, again, I'm not getting paid for this, so, um, but I, I use Canson paper um, as well as some of the Epson papers, and it's something that um, they do have what we call a sample pack where it has one of each sheet um, of their fine art paper. There is a photo fine art pack where it has some of their papers like Platine. So Platine was like this beautiful paper, brilliant for black and whites, similar to like Epson traditional uh, photo paper, but it doesn't have an optical brightener in it. So it's not that sort of very bluey, sort of bluey sort of color look that uh, Epson uh, traditional has or exhibition fiber has. It's um, much more neutral. Uh, but again, instead of rushing out and buying, you know, rolls of the stuff or, or you know, large boxes of them, just get the sample pack and play around with it. Um, print on it. Uh, again, this is where what you do is you print the t PDI test image on each of the papers and that's how you compare almost apples with apples, so to speak. Um, can I print in Adobe, sorry I'm just answering some other questions here, can I print in Adobe RGB or do I need to print CMYK? I'd leave it in, oh, okay yes, uh, so open the file into Adobe RGB um, and then you can then save that image again with the Adobe uh, RGB profile attached to it. So when you do open it in Illustrator, it should then be bringing it in into uh, an RGB document with the Adobe RGB profile to it. Yes, um, sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Is it Essie? I'm going to apologize if I've got that incorrectly. Um, but uh, Essie's asked a question that uh, we sell papers from Ilford and Canson. Is it possible to send me profiles from Ilford? Yeah, I can um, do that for you because the Ilford site's down. Um, I don't really want to announce anything on a webinar because it hasn't been confirmed, but if someone happens to Google things on Ilford, um, you'll be able to find out why that might be actually happening there. Again, I don't want to spread any rumors. Uh, there's not a lot of us in the room, but again, we are recording it and we are going to share it. So for the smart people, you'll be able to find out what's actually happening there. All right, uh, Paul, uh, try to use the Spider 4 on an older basic Dell monitor with no adjustable lighting, gamma or brightness on it. So the screen went yellow. I currently use a Dell UltraSharp. Yeah, the, uh, the Spider would work fine with the Dell UltraSharp. I'm going to point out one thing with Dell. Um, again, I don't want to seem like I'm slandering any bad brain, uh, like, you know, monitor it badly or anything like that. I'm trying to give the information openly. Um, the Dell UltraSharps, when they say that they're calibrated to the Adobe standard, they are and they're actually quite accurate, but they only calibrate them to be accurate for the first two inches of the middle of the monitor. And then you can have out on the edges a 25% difference. And you can actually, funny enough, Google that in the Dell support forums. Um, again, I, uh, 
partly of my work is that yeah, people contact me like you guys here with problems, and you know we do a bit of research and we find out what's going on there. Um, and this is something that uh, we stumbled across recently earlier on in the year. Uh, it took us a couple of months to uh, with this particular fr um, friend of mine, and uh, we ended up finding out that the the Dells were color accurate for Adobe in the first two inches of the screen, and then everything outside of that wasn't. And again, we were able to actually use the Spider um, MQA software, the the monitor quality analysis, to uh, prove that. And um, and it was yeah a quite a huge dramatic difference. So again, Paul, I'm not trying to say you bought the wrong monitor, but just keep that in mind with the the Dell Ultra Sharp is that you'll get a nice accurate reading in the middle, but then out in the edges when you have like a neutral 50% grey across your desktop, you can see a, a difference in that um, section. And to answer the second part of your question about the webinar, yes, we will be uh, posting up a link to it later on. Probably gives a day or so, and we can take it from there. Um, Hannah Mule, yes, or you almost spelt correctly, but I do know where you're going there, Stephen. Uh, is it any good? You're talking a paper? Yeah, there's not many paper manufacturers around anymore. Um, and that's just due to, you know, time and technology and so on. Um, and yeah, Hannah Mule and Canson have been making paper for well over 400 years. Or well, I know Canson has. Funny enough, if you look at the Canson logo, again, I'm, I'm not actually here for uh, Canson. Sorry, guys, from Data Color. But um, it's actually the first, Canson made the first hot air balloon uh, or, or helped make the first hot air balloon out of paper, believe it or not. Um, you know, highly flammable gas and paper. Or lucky the thing didn't burn up, but if you look at their logo, it's the first hot air balloon, and they've been doing paper for 400 odd years. So some very, um, very fine art thing, uh, very fine art, very high quality. So things like Picasso's etchings are actually done on Montfal uh, from Canson, which then, funny enough, you can print on your inkjet printer with the same sort of paintings that Picasso and those guys have, you know, have drawn on. So that's how crazy it is. Yeah, uh, Ute. Um, that's a cool name, I've got to say. That's very cool. I paid for an upgrade on Software Online Spy Elite. It was, it was reasonably current. My original on goal was Spy. Yeah, that's fine. So if you want to, uh, you, uh, well, it's a cool name, sorry. Uh, you, if yeah, you, you want to go up to the Spider 4, um, that's fine. All we need is the dongle number. We don't care whether it's been the Pro 3 Pro and you've upgraded to the Elite. It's just we need the dongle number and then we let. Um, uh, yeah, data color know that we've had this come through. Uh, Lightroom doesn't support CMYK. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lightroom's, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know why you're working in CMYK. Um, in the last couple of webinars, I've noticed guys com coming through working with CMYK. Um, no, Lightroom's more of a, an RGB workflow tool. Um, that's because of their uh, uh, color engine that they actually use is a version of Profoto. It's not the same one that you can download. It's a, a especially tweaked one from the engineers at Adobe, and um, it is a. I'm going to say, what is it? Um, a they actually, I think, from memory, call it Melissa RGB, which was uh, one of the wife's. Um, of the engineer who wrote it. Sorry, and I was just uh, going to bring up to make sure everything was looking okay. Um, now. I'm just having a look through. Yes, thanks. Cool, thanks, guy. Oh, cool. I did get your name right. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Now, before I duck off and do anything else, I'm going to ask some questions about what would you, would you guys like to see in the next webinar? So I'll let that run through, guys, and I'll I can sit here and make some chit chat. Um, Again, it can be worth, um, again, the, even Epson's brought out these sample packs of the paper, so I do encourage a lot of people when we've got these printers, yeah, print um, on sample packs. You know, back in the earlier days when I, you know, I've got still boxes of paper that I have only got halfway through because I didn't, um, not that I didn't like it, but I could only buy a roll um, and so on. Wow, so 20%, uh, 20, okay, about say 30% of you using the Capture Pro. Okay, I can um, work on something like that to be a little bit later. The advanced functions of Spider, I was going to step through that really quickly uh, tonight. Again, you know, I, I can keep talking underwater, guys, for the people that know me, I can keep doing that. Um, 
and I haven't had any complaints from anyone yet so far, so that's okay. Using our professional software, um, such as Lightroom and Capture One. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thanks, guys. That's actually been the highest one so much. Okay, that's interesting to know. Well, I'll put Spider TV uh, HD on the, you know, to do down the list further down. Because again, what I wanted to try and do with this was bring all of you guys up without sounding rude to a sort of a common known uh, denominator. Because I don't know everyone in here in the room, so I'm trying to um, make it easier that people can also go back and uh, watch this webinar. So when they attend the next one they've got a better understanding. Um, because again, like I could do when I do go out to tapes and so on, um, people ask me, is it important to calibrate the monitor? And I'm going to say it is the most important thing to do. Um, you know, we all go into electronic stores that sell TVs. You know, the next time you happen to be walking in there, you'll notice that there's all these different, you know, looks. Now if we were to calibrate them all, which would you know, take a very long time. They'd all look very similar to each other, um, or a lot, a lot closer to each other than what they do at the moment. And obviously, those TV manufacturers wouldn't be able to sell TVs because they'd look very, very similar. So, um, this is what sort of calibration does: is it brings the monitor into a known point, and then, you know, considering we spend so much on our gear, printers, ink, paper, monitors. Um, I'm going to say in some ways the spider is such a small insignificant amount, like I have children as well as most of you guys probably do as well. So you know a couple of hundred dollars out of a back pocket does sort of hurt, but in the grand scheme of things compared to the rest of the gear I've spent money on, um, it's something that I just can't see why not to have the calibration. It makes life so much easier on the long run. Um, <laughs> thank you Michael, um, you've got to go and watch the State of Origin. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's um, great. Well, look, you know, we are recording it, so if you missed the last five minutes of the beginning, you can come through. Um, oh, okay. Thank you, um, Essie, about uh, to print CMYK. Um, if you're going to print CMYK, uh, yeah, either open it into Photoshop. If you happen to be using Epson printers, there's a really nice, easy program that does a great CMYK conversion to RGB for printing, and it's a program called Mirage. Where do I find the Spider 3, Spider 3 dongle number? Where the USB port, uh, where it connects into the USB port, there used to be a label on them and it had the dongle number or we can do it this way in the software. So let me just get the data color software up so you guys can see this on screen hopefully now. And what we can do is on a Mac, if I click into the preferences of the application, so just here, so let me just zoom in. In preferences, just here, and Windows is the same. You go into the preferences, you can see here. Here's my dongle number: zero uh, seven one zero seven three three three. Don't use that dongle number. The guys in the showroom know my dongle number, <laughs> but there, that's my dongle there of my Spider Four. So, um, guys, you can actually then go through uh, and find that. So, just start up your application, um, copy and paste that in there, and then. Um, We'll be able to get that through. Uh, Spider two users, it's again, it will normally be in the preferences uh, section as well. And you can sometimes, I think from memory, again, the Spider two box used to have it on the box as well. Uh, with that, yes, the number on the USB plug that is the dongle number. So sorry, we call the Spider a dongle because uh, it's a, probably a term that. It's stuck around in the early days of the computer industry. Uh, let me just close this poll. So, oh, I'll apologize for that. I've just realized I had the poll there. Sorry about that. Let me go back. I'll apologize for that. So, let me just zoom in over here. My bad. So, uh, zoom out. We go into preferences. And then here, that opens up. That, so, so Spider Four, and that's that's my dongle number. You'll normally find that is the same label that is on that USB part of the dongle. I apologise for that, guys. Sorry, that was. Okay. On future webinars, can I uh, talk about uh, specific calibration of the video camera to computer and TV? 
yeah, we can do that, Ricky. Um, I'll probably concentrate on some of the other ones that have popped up first, like the professional software, but definitely I can put that on the list. That's good to know. Thank you for voting on that because it does help us know. Um, like all of them, thank you, Peter. That's great. Uh, I selected using advanced functions in the Spider for Elite. Yeah. Okay, Robert, you've joined a little bit late, so why we should upgrade to the Spider 4? Well, we are talking a bit earlier on in the first sort of slides. You can go back, we will post this video up, um, as I said earlier, later, uh, sorry, in the next couple of days we'll post this up onto YouTube and we'll send out a link to you guys. Basically, we just went through the differences in the hardware, such as the filters, the, um, the organic filters in the 3 and the 2. Uh, so I'd be saying, Robert, you know, depending on um, if you're using the 3, and let's say, my, like, I think from memory the 3 is about 5 years old now as a model number, um, those filters would start to deteriorate over time and that's just because they use an organic filter. Um, sorry guys about the can't seeing it, I can only see the poll submitted screen, sorry. Uh, see unfortunately the questions don't keep scrolling down as it's coming through. Okay, it doesn't seem to change the price, is that the upgrade code? Um, hey Joey, sorry, this is one of the guys in uh, Data Color. Can you just double check that I've got the upgrade code correctly, please? Sorry to do this, guys. Uh, did we go to datacolor.com.au to order the upgrade? No. So what we do is I'll let me bring this uh, slide up for you, and this is going to be the. If you go to klaustralia.com.au. Uh, so just, or you can just Google KL, uh, K-A-Y-E-L-L, -L, and then um, you can also find us on Facebook. And for some weird reason, there should be a Data Color Australia here as well, but it doesn't look like it's exported out into the PDF. And again, this is a PDF that I put together that I'm, I'll share with the guys from Data Color, and if they want to put it up into Data Color Australia, you guys can um, get access to it there. Got to run. Yes, yeah, please speed it up, uh, Stephen, sorry, not Peter, keep in touch. Um, all right, guys, it looks like you're going good. Um, yes, what we'll do is we'll post, we'll email out this uh, image to you. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll double check that I have the code. It should work. Let me just try quickly the advantages of having two monitors. It's when you go into the cart, it's, remember it's only on the Pro and the Elite when you uh, go into the shopping cart and go to check out. Yeah, sorry Joey because my laptop died last, uh, my, unfortunately my laptop died on Tuesday. so. I did have the code in there, but I just can't check it, that's all. So it should have been sent to you from us not that long ago. Hi. Are the webinars recorded to access after the event? Yes, so what I'm actually recording currently on my computer at the moment, and uh, so is the guys in uh, overseas. Um, they'll be able to actually, um, what we'll do is we'll convert it, because they have to go through a conversion engine, and then we'll be able to post it up. So. I've got to have dinner after this because I actually haven't eaten yet. But yeah, we'll, we'll work on it and then we'll email out you got like to everyone here. Yeah, we're just having a look at that, Tony, there for you. So just give us a moment, I'll make sure. Um, Sharon, to answer your question, yes, uh, look, we'll work on something there. Um, We'll see what we can do, but yeah, if you can get in contact with us, um, I'll, I'll talk to the powers that be and we'll see what we can do there. Thanks, Liz. Thank you very much for that. The Pro versus the Elite, uh, this is coming from Robert. Um, will they both do TVs? Um, if we're controlling the laptop through the TV, uh, or sorry, if we're having the TV controlled via the laptop through, say, a HDMI port, then yes, um, we can run the, the screen calibrator on it. If we're, we're talking about doing actually 
uh, calibration um, from our DVD or Blu-ray player, then no, you have to do an extra uh, purchase there um, with it. But you can upgrade either the Elite or the Pro to the TV version, and it's actually a Blu-ray disc in the box, a uh, DVD in the box, and a um, Sorry, I was, I was trying to read another question. Uh, and there's a special little holder for the spider that allows us to hold the spider onto these 40-inch TVs. Thank you very much, Liz, for that. Uh, thank you, Simon. And thank you, Paul. So, guys, it looks like um, we've gone through. I just want to run one quick poll before everyone disappears. Do you think... Uh, let's let me launch this poll. And this is what I was saying earlier about uh, if you, it's a bit of a direct question to you guys, but um, do you think something like this webinar where we're getting 30% off, um, do you think it's uh, you know worth it? Please, guys, you know vote. Wow, that's really good. Thank you guys for um, sending that back. Uh, it's something that um, I was talking to the bosses about asking this question, and I thought I've got to ask you guys because you're our clientele. And if you can't tell us, then um, it, it does make it a bit hard there. So that's excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's something. If I can't ask you guys, then um, yeah, it makes it a bit hard. We sort of you know, uh, just don't know which way to go. So I'll close that off. So it should be spider up G. Uh, Joey, how did you go with finding that code? That should be right. Let me just go back to that screen. Oh, did you, were you guys typing it in capitals by any chance? Will it do a 65? Oh, sorry, I'm just answering Robert's question while I'm... So that is the code, Joey? Sorry, I'm having two conversations here. Um, Will it do a 65-inch TV? I believe it can. It's actually these elastic straps. Um, yeah, so you should be able to wrap that around. You can also do projectors there as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Claudio. And thank you, Sharon. That's good. Thank you guys for the feedback because the more feedback that I get, I can also feed on to the other guys like uh, uh, Matt Granger and Peter Eastway for when they're doing their talks. So obviously I know you guys want um, some stuff on using the pro software so that does allow me to um, get through there. Do you guys want me to keep going if you don't mind me asking? Do you recommend uh, consumer grade light bulbs as we can buy from Bunnings for a working room? Or, of course, daylight ones. Um, good question. Thanks um, for that question. So, the question was basically to do with the light bulbs. Can we buy them from Bunnings? Look, when you're up, Bunnings, they aren't, they aren't the highest quality, but they're a starting point. And obviously, um, I, I, you know, full disclosure, KL, we sell the high-end ones that go at the end of million-dollar printing presses, a company called GTI. There are other companies around, like Just, uh, it's spelt J-U-S-T, they're an, um, a, another European company. Uh, then you also have uh, these little gaffy lights um, that you can find, um, the, the little A4 and A3 Plus ones. Um, Solux is another company, so anyone that's got these halogen downlight globes, these tend to be used in actually in galleries and so on. Um, Solux, it's spelled S-O-L-U-X. Um, you can Google those and they're downlight globes and they do replicate daylight there. Okay, thanks Charles. No, Peter, the discount isn't on the Spider Capture Pro, um, but we would be able to we would be able to take care of you guys. Uh, how long is the offer for? Till the end of June. So when uh, Matt Granger comes up, I think he's going to do another one in the next couple of weeks. So that's we haven't locked in a date yet. You'll find that we'll have this code pop back up again uh, for you guys. 
Sorry, longer than two months for me. No, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for feeding that back to us. Um, that's good to know. Look, always keep around. Yeah. I'm gonna, can someone try and lowercase for me? I just it was when I was putting this presentation together, I did have our caps locks turned on. <laughs> oh, okay, we don't have a league supporter in the room. Thank you. Ah, uh, is normal date? Oh, okay, I mean, okay. So from uh, again, uh, when checking the prints, and it's night. In my case, a black room is normal daylight bulbs. Okay, yeah, it's a starting point, Essie. Um, so these bunning, these daylight bunnings globes that we get, they don't actually um, project uh, the right amount of daylight. If that makes sense, um, they get what we call quite spiky. Uh, without boring you guys to death and bringing up graphs and charts, but it's a starting point. If you could look at things like a little lighting booth or a, a simple baton, um, then that would definitely work out there. No, Michael, that uh, code won't work for the whole kit there. Yes, Doug, you can do that. Um, that's not a problem. We're, I'm just trying to get Joey to check on the code for me and just trying to see if he can search his email address as well. I've got you guys on the line. <laughs> oh, it's good to see we've got a Queenslander in the room. Thank you. Did uh, Doug, did that work in lowercase fails? Uh, neither uppercase will work. Look, I'm going to apologize for that. I may have actually had the um, coding correctly as I said when I was putting I put this presentation together a couple of months ago and then when I got the promo code um, yeah unfortunately Tuesday night my laptop hard drive went belly up what I'll work is um, I'll double check tomorrow morning what the code is and because we've got your email addresses I'll uh, try and organize an email out to you guys ASAP and then if you can get um, on then you can plug into the code the correct code I thought it was spider up G or it may have been that um, we could be having something with our system too but uh, yes, Doug, you can go into the showroom. Yes, Perry, um, that's what I was saying before, that the code, we think there's an issue there. Yes, Joey, hello. Oh. Unmuted. So, so Luke, can, can you can you show me the screen with the heart rate yeah. I didn't do? Yeah, because I, I, sent, I sent you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I sent you, yeah, I yeah, sent you the chat in, inside the uh, control, but <laughs> I, can't, I can't get your results, so that's why I just waiting for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fine. Can you check the code for me that Josh would have sent you? Okay, sure. One second. All right. So this is again where we find the dongle number there. How about new LED light panels? Um, I'm going to say I'd hold off on LED light panels for the moment. Um, but it's still a very new technology for... Um, yeah, hi. Okay, look, I've sent you yep. through the chat, within the chat panel. Yeah. Okay. Go to meeting control panel. There is a chat. You can see mm -hmm. the numbers. Yeah. Yep. But what's that code for? Uh, for the react, you mean you mean you mean you can just do it with the with the, the newer version of the software. Yeah, the reactivate. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I'm activated. Fine. I was saying, can you check on the code for um the promo code? That's what I was asking you. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. His yeah. laptop tire. Oh sorry, sorry, sorry. That's the, that's the code that I'm after. Sorry, Joey was looking up. Uh, okay. Again, guys. Uh, oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to do it. Yeah, if you can do that. And I'll, so, guys that are still on there, there we are. The modern of technology. Uh, so, what actually Joey was doing was he was actually looking up my hardware and bringing up my what we call activation code because we thought that he thought there was a problem. So, this is one thing that is worth doing is register your details. Um, because at any time that you do lose your software key that's on the back of the uh, CD case, 
um, you can contact, actually you can go to register, I think it's register.datacolor.com and actually retrieve what your serial number is and then put it back into the data color software. Okay, Brendan, um, you wanted to, sorry, I'm just, while I'm waiting for Joey, um, could I compare the Spider Elite over the i1 Display Pro? So if we're talking there, the i1 device, the X-Rite device, um, which is for doing the display, not their spectrophotometer, the $2,000 piece of hardware, they're uh, one that's com comparable to the Elite. Basically, uh, they do the same unit for what, when the Spider 3 was brought out a couple of years ago, where we had this um, monitor quality function where we could check the, you know, the, how continuous tone the screen was and so on, um, you couldn't do that. And then uh, I think really to be honest, what we're seeing in the data color products, they've sort of sent the, be well, pardon me, sorry guys, uh, the benchmark and um, from there we have, um, they're like now I'm going to say x right uh, yeah, they followed very closely behind. But again, they have their version of the x right checker and um, you can use that as again as a soft proofing tool. Um, but they do the same functionality, brightness, contrast, uh, what we've just seen, what I can do in the Elite software, you can just do in the um, i1 display. Person myself, I get access to all these toys. Um, and I've used both. It's not just because I'm doing this is for data color. Um, it's been something that I've had a lot more success over the years with the data color. The earlier display one, uh, early i1 displays, um, I'm not talking the one that's currently on the market, uh, the earlier ones, they actually used to, their organic filter that they used to have inside of their um, sensor used to actually drop out, believe it or not, and then you'd get a very cyan cast when you'd calibrate. That's true, Essie. Yes, they do produce LED uh, panels about 4,800 Kelvin. Um, yeah, you want about 5,000 Kelvin, but it's also across the whole spectrum. Yes, Robert, you're quite correct on that. Yes, Tony, we're just trying to figure that out. Uh... Yeah, we're just trying to double check the code for you guys. So I've got um, the guys overseas working on that for me at the moment. Yeah, Doug, we'll order. We'll, as I said, if we can't get it to you tonight, I'll um, I'll yeah get on early tomorrow morning and email you guys out. Oh, and thank you, Doug, too. <laughs> no, I'm happy to make sure you guys are good. Yeah. Okay, guys. Oh, look. Yeah, the guys are trying to find the email and they can't find it either. You've got to love technology. What we'll do is we'll email you guys the whole list. I do apologize for that. Um, I did check on Tuesday when my laptop dry, died. I may have just had it. it might have been spider with a space up G or something. Um, I don't actually control our website with the code, but I'll work on that. And I, I'm really sorry because I tried to make this perfect. I'm a bit, I'm a bit like that. Um, Yes, the upgrade is through KL. Um, you will see from time to time over the next couple of webinars over the you know, coming months and probably a couple of years, we will do sometimes through resellers as well. Um, you know, it's just to go through. I, I'm going to ask one question for the people that are left in the room. So there's still a lot of you guys around, that's cool. Um, I know obviously data color offer incentives, but would you like other incentives other than data color products, if you don't mind me asking. Um, you know, if you want to shoot that through quickly now in the message boards, that's cool. Um, I'm not making promises that we're going to deliver a bowl full of M&Ms or anything like that. Uh, I'm just curious to know um, myself personally, because we'll have this discussion about this. But yes, again, to answer the question is it is through KL, just go to KL Australia. Um, and again, uh, and it is supposed to be Data Color Australia there as well, but unfortunately there. And then any technical questions as well, you can either shoot stuff through on Facebook through to Data Color Australia or even datacolor.com slash support or again um, info at KL and yeah, we can definitely help you out there.
<laughs> no M and M's. Oh, I like that. That's good. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you for the, your input. Um, you know, as I said, I'm not trying to make a promise or anything like that, but I'm just trying to understand you guys. And now that that definitely helps. Um, yeah, you know, for us to keep things in mind. All right. If no one's got, has anyone else got any more questions while I'm here that um, they might 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 want me to answer. Um, I must say thank you guys for being patient with me. This has actually been my first uh, webinar flying solo. Um, I've done webinars for Odd One with people and obviously Peter and uh, a lot of other guys and Adobe, but um, thank you for being patient. I know I've made some little uh, problems there, but thank you. Thanks Tamara, thank you very much for that. As I said, guys, any questions, just yeah, feel free to uh, drop it through and um, yeah, send it through there. Either on, as I said, Facebook. Um, you know, we, yeah, sometimes I actually happen to answer them on the weekend as well. So, thanks, Essie. Thank you, Peter. Oh, thank you, Charles. Yes, it was difficult. <laughs> and we'll share it on Facebook as well again. So. I'm going to um, let you guys going. Uh, for the people who might have been watching State of Origin in the background, please don't share the score with me. Um, I'm not a massive football follower, but I've you know, got to keep up to date on things like this. So, look, I'm going to sign off for the tonight. Thank you, guys, again. Look, let's look forward. Hopefully, I can get something together in the next say, month or so to put on another webinar, and um, we can take it from there. But thank you, guys, very much for that. Cool, cool. Where are we going? What's happening?